Yep. Yep. Hello and welcome to episode 35, believe it or not, of Alta Asks Live, the digital event series we do here at altaonline.com. My name is Beth Spotswood. I am Alta's digital editor, and I am joining you about two minutes late today because Ken Lane, Blazeriga, and I were just talking about aliens. So I will get straight to the intros um, and we can get this show on the road. Wait, are you saying we're aliens? No, we were discussing aliens. Um, today, in addition to talking about aliens, I am excited to welcome Desert Oracle publisher, editor, author, and radio and podcast host, Ken Lane. Ken is joining us from Joshua Tree, the desert, of course, to talk to us today about his new book, Desert Oracle, Volume 1. I'm going to let him and Blaze, Alta's managing editor, dive into that right away. I do want to let you know if you've got questions, and I'm pretty sure that you do for Ken, you can use this chat feature to ask them or there's a question button as well. If you'd like more info about Desert Oracle Volume 1 um, or to buy it, you can click on the Buy the Book button right below us, um, and that'll take you to bookshop.org. It's, uh, it supports independent booksellers and it's uh, how we sell you books here. So um, without further ado, I'll be back at the end to ask um, Ken and Blaze any questions you have, but I'm gonna let these two take it away. Thanks. Thank Blaise. you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. So first off, Ken, congratulations. Hello, congratulations. Thank so you. So excited to see this. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a long time fan of, of the desert oracle oh you've got all the, yeah. the out of print old issues and uh so it's, it's a it's a real thrill to be here today uh with you and uh you know so let, let's get started i was thinking about your book and i realized that you can't really talk about your book without talking about this book in some ways when yeah. when when this book came out in 1968, uh, you know the naturalist uh, Edwin uh, Way Teal, and you you reference this in, in your introduction, I believe. Um, he wrote a review for the New York Times of Desert Solitaire, and he described it as a wild ride on a bucking bronco, and its author as a rebel, an in, and a an eloquent loner. Uh, he, he describes the book as containing stories about finding a dead tourist under a lone juniper tree luring a moon-eyed horse from a canyon, guzzling near beer with Mormon uranium miners at a Moab honky-tonk, and walking the lonesome trails. Um, and, and I raise this point, not just to point out similarities, uh, but rather to say your book's a lot more fun. You know, you, you give us tales of the Yucca Man, of a hermit ballerina, uh, Shoshone legends, cursed petroglyphs, you know, and much more. And, and at the same time, I gotta tell you, your, your writing, it's, it's just full of quiet pathos, and, and insights. It, it's really, I, I really enjoy this this book. I, I'm sure it will. You know, but also, you know, but like Abby, your book is also a plea to save the desert. You know, yeah. you, you two to seem to be offering the book uh, in the same spirit. And the dedication reads, for the good people who love and protect the desert wilderness. So that's my first question is what was the uh, impetus? What, what, why did you decide to take you know the, these books, and put uh, and put the stories inside two hard, between two hard covers. Well, uh, I I do love the desert. This is my home. Uh, for much of my life, I've seen it assaulted, mm. assaulted by uh, especially in the the Sun Belt, the southern parts of the American desert. Uh, Phoenix, Las Vegas, the suburbs of of Los Angeles. And I, I want as much of it as is here today to stay that way. And there's a lot of it that we can restore and bring it back to not only habitat for Mojave plants and animals and the Mojave here, but throughout the desert. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it also functions as a, a, a carbon sink. Yes. Just like the rainforest in the Amazon or our conifer forest in, in the mountains. Uh, so why a book? Because economically, as we've talked about before, I can't afford to reprint these issues. Mm -hmm. Every time I make an issue, it costs the same whether it's new or it's a reprint. And so subscribers, as you know, uh, 
prefer that their magazines be new. When they come <laughs> in the so by doing a book, I was able to get a lot of the stuff from the back issues and then write a bunch of new stuff, including a lot of stuff that started off as kind of radio sermons. Mm -hmm. on the radio mm -hmm. show right. And, and, you know, and I think that we all share, you know, many of us, um, your admiration um, and respect for the desert. And one of the things that we, we talked about, you mentioned, is that this is, you know, it's millions of acres without a fence. You know, it's probably yeah. the only region of, of North America, or the United States, I should say, you know, without that, really. Um, and, and it makes it so, so, so special. And so what, how, you know, over the past four years, though, I mean, what, what's been your reaction to the, say, you know, watching Bears Ears get dismantled or the uh, Ash Metal Preserve, those, those 13 acres were... Um, there's only what, there's 20 species of plants. That's the only place on the planet where, where they uh, where they live. And I believe Ash Meadow is also where the uh, the remains of the brothel are. The ruins of the brothel where Edward Abbey wrote uh, Desert Solitaire. Yeah, yeah. Look, there? Most of Ash Meadows is protected. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a, a wildlife refuge uh, under Fish and Wildlife. And so there's a few bits have been lost. Bears Ears has been a, a, a tough monument from the time it was announced. The, mm -hmm. I mean, I love the place. I know uh, people love it. And I know the, the tribes and the people of Utah and desert conservationists worked together a long time to put, to put that together. But it didn't have quite the, the local support that it should have had. And like so many of these national monuments say they get uh, anointed under the Antiquities Act and then they don't get budgeted. You know, there's no, there's not rangers. There's not people to watch out for them, to take care of them. And so when you have a national monument, you do need to get local support. And it's got to people need to realize that it puts money into the economy. Mm -hmm. Those are the jobs. That's how it is here in the Mojave. You know, Death Valley and Joshua Tree were national monuments long before. They were uh, national parks. Now, and, and also in the last four years, and this is little known because it was kind of a, a constant wave of, of, of bad environmental news over these past four years, but there were also some real bright spots. One was the Land and Water Conservation Fund got permanently funded mm. by Congress, and that's the law. It had been an annual struggle forever. Right. You got to somehow come up with the funding. Oh, you know, these guys don't want to do it, whatever. Right. Now it's funded every year. It's a lot of money. It's good for every state. Every state has conservation areas. And the second California Desert Protection Act came through in 2018, right. signed signed by our, our lovely president, and everybody was happy with it. It added a lot of acres to sure. Death Valley, to Mojave National Preserve. It added... Uh, um, it filled in a lot of spots, and it made some good permanent desert protection. We yeah, we wrote about the the, the first the first one. Um, I guess it was nineteen ninety four. The first the, one was ninety four. California yeah. Desert Protection Act. Yeah, twenty yeah, fifth anniversary of it yeah. at Amboy Crater just last year when we could do things in public. I did a camp right. for stories out there. We had a hundred people at Amboy Crater in the middle. All right. of the so, so, wait, so so you you reference campfire so so, so let's go to a campfire store i mean your, your book is full of you know the, so many great tales so many lore and legends you know yucca man there's lost civilizations 10 foot warriors um what's your what, what's your favorite tale in, in this book what's your favorite one i think the i think my favorite story just because it tells so much about about California as it grew out of its original cities. The stories about the desert Sasquatch around Edwards Air Force Base and the mm -hmm. aerospace worker suburbs in Antelope Valley, Lancaster and Palmdale. They, in the early 70s, and this happens a lot, you look wherever new, new settlements have been cut into the land, new highways, tract homes, and big box stores and everything. It's like the, the world is, uh, uh, is protesting. And the way it protests is these monsters start appearing. So the desert mm -hmm. Sasquatch 
was showing up all over the place. People would see it out there sliding glass doors of these, you know, three, two track tones in Palmdale mm -hmm. and uh, Lancaster. And people were in a frenzy. So two posses got together, mostly a lot of military veterans who work for aerospace industries, the uh, Edwards Skunk Works, et cetera. And they went out into the, the dry creek behind the newest suburbs to go hunt for the desert Sasquatch and kill it. And <laughs> they, they got on either side of each other. Both oh, groups of these vigilantes heard noises on the other side, on the other side of the desert willows and such in the dry creek. And they just about opened fire on each other. This was 1972, it's in the Lancaster newspaper. Yeah, <laughs> I really reference that. And then, um... What about your own strange encounter? Uh, in, in your book, you, you reference um, driving one night on Amboy Road and a pair of headlights. Oh, yeah, I've had a few. That was, that was one that I did not consider to be some sort of supernatural event until afterwards. All right, would you tell the audience what, what happened? I'm coming from Roy's. You know where Roy's is mm -hmm. uh, in uh, on Route 66, the old gas station, the hotel. It's been in a lot of horror movies. On the mother road, yeah. Uh -huh. And so I'm coming from there back to Wonder Valley to home in Joshua Tree. It's the middle of the night. I had been up in Death Valley during the super bloom, I believe. And I could not find a hotel room. And I didn't have camping stuff. It was one of those days. It's like, yeah, it sounds great. I'm going to hop in the car. I got some time and go see it. So I ended up driving back, whatever. It's a couple hours. I love driving in the middle of the night in the desert. So I'm coming back. There's nobody else on the road. I haven't seen anyone. I go past the one place where the CHP hides. There's nobody there. And I'm like, all right, open it up. Go up the grade. So I'm doing about, I don't know, 80 or something coming up the hill. And I see some lights behind me. <laughs> Two lights, no headlights. And I I gently adjust my cruise control so I get back down to a 60 or so. It's 55 there. And these lights shoot straight up behind me. I mean, this is a 12 or 14 mile grade that goes up to the old woman mountains and the sheephole wilderness. Mm -hmm. And after you come down that grade, you go into into Wonder Valley. So in a it seemed like, I don't know, 30, 60 seconds. That whole distance is covered, and they're right behind me, just blinding me in my rear view. And I think, well, it's not a cop because I'm not speeding now. And it's got to be some local lunatic. <laughs> One of those posses. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I do what uh, many drivers will do when somebody gets right on their ass. I just slow down and slow down. And finally, I'm like, all right, I've had enough. I stop. Mm. I stop on the road. And the lights, as I turn my head, shoot back all the way down to the bottom of the dry lake. I mean, they must have been going two, 300 miles an hour. It was just, <laughs> it wasn't a car. Whoa. Uh -huh. And so I start looking around for stories later after I kind of process it. And there are incidents all over, but especially in the mountains of Southern California, the deserts of Southern California, of these ghost lights pursuing drivers on highways. Any per on that stretch of uh, Amboy Road? I, I, I have heard personally some yeah. stories, for instance, that, that Amboy Camp campfire stories we did mm -hmm. with Mojave Desert Land Trust and Mojave Trails National Monument. Right. A guy came up to me afterwards, he's a photographer, and he's around there a lot doing nature photography. Mm -hmm. Same thing had happened to him. He got out, no car. Right, wow. <laughs> I've got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, try it sometime. I, I encourage everyone to go drive around in the middle of the night and see if anything weird happens. Yeah. Well, speaking of weird, okay, we were starting to talk about the, the desert as you know, talking about the plants there, but we haven't yet spoken about any of the animals, and certainly, there's dangerous animals, meaning, you know, rattlesnakes or coyotes and scorpions and so on. Uh, but in your book, you also reference what you think is the scariest animal. It's only four inches. You want to share that? Yeah, this is one that doesn't come up too much. 
Uh, and there are variants across the Western and Midwestern United States, but it's called the grasshopper mouse. The grasshopper mouse looks like a mini kangaroo rat. Kangaroo rat might be like this with the tail. Grasshopper mouse is like this. Mm. Grasshopper mouse loves to eat venomous insects. His favorite things to eat are desert centipedes and scorpions. And this is the insane thing. When it eats a scorpion, it eats the stinger first. It breaks off the stinger, chews it, and it sort of transforms the venom into an anti-venom in its digestive tract. So it feels no pain from this. In fact, it gets high from it. It's like a painkiller or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, you know, it's like it just had a bottle of Oxycontin or something. Yeah. And then it feasts on the rest of it. And when it's done with the killing, and you know, the scorpions out here can be as big as a grasshopper mouse. Uh huh. It then throws back its head and it howls like a little yeah. coyote, high pitched. Mm -hmm. And once you hear this, go outside if you're in the desert, like at a late night at a campsite or out wandering around, and you'll hear these high pitched kind of screeches. And it's very eerie. All right. Oh, what? What? Um. And so, there's another sort of odd animal, I guess I'll call it. Um, and you describe it, the chapter is the the hibernating bird. Oh yeah. Can you tell us about that? The hibernating sure. bird was a great discovery of the pioneering desert biologist Dr. Edmund Yeager, uh, J A E G E R, who taught and researched for UC Riverside for decades, I believe. He was part of the original Bohemian artists colony in the canyons of Palm Springs before the health resorts were built there. And he was going around south of Eagle Mountain, around Desert Center, walking with some of his student helpers, and he finds what looks like a dead bird kind of smacked up against a boulder. And it's winter, it's February, January, I don't recall. And he picks it up. Like, this bird's alive. The feathers were all ruffled and the wind damaged and everything, but the bird's just in this the shallowest of little nooks. So he bans it, and they come back a couple weeks later, it's still there. It has a moat. No hibernating bird had ever been confirmed by science before mm. that. Although, as is often the case, the desert tribes had much experience with these hibernating birds. The bird was a poor will. The poor will is a, a, like a night jar. Night mm -hmm. jars are these haunted birds that are out at night and they make these awful kind of yeah. and they have big mouths like a jar and they eat bugs. They like to hang around your pork slide. And this is a bird that the, the Hopis call the, the sleeping one, I think. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hol Holchek, I believe. Uh, wow. Is a nominal yeah. bird. Yeah. And, and so you, you mentioned Jaeger, and, and he's a writer that I had not heard of, but I'm going to check him out. Um, you know, the, uh, other writers who, who loom large, you know, Mary Austin. He's great. All of his books are great. Yeah. This is one, Desert Wildflowers. You know, here, here's Rainer Banham on the scenes in America. Desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, just, I was look, reading that on Kim Stringfellow's Mojave Project. Yeah, check out the Mojave Project, everyone. Go to, I highly recommend that that site. Um, it's got the color version of this photo. But, Ken, who, who are some other writers that um, people sh should know about, other books you might recommend about uh, writing about the desert? Uh, I, I prefer the nonfiction books. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So uh, the the classics are classics because they're good, and the mm -hmm. desert has been a little underexplored yeah. uh, for literary nonfiction, I guess. Mm -hmm. so Mary Hunter Austin's The Land of Little Rain is just such a beautiful book because it doesn't read like an old book. Her prose is very modern. She was very modern. She was... Mm -hmm. uh, 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 pioneering feminist, socialist, New York playwright, and it's it just sparkles. It's just great prose. Uh, Terry Tempest Williams writes very well she's great, uh, yes. about the desert. Of course, she's not in our part of the desert, so mm -hmm. um, 
the California deserts. The California deserts have often kind of been ignored because not much grows. The Mojave is the hottest and the driest desert in the southwestern in the in the United States, mm -hmm. and it's often been thought of as this wasteland that's getting in the way of L.A. taking over the entire southern half of the state. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you mentioned earlier, you know, your fondness for, for late night drives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and what's magical about them? And do you listen to, you know, radio or, or sing? Or yeah. I, I, um, there was a golden kind of age of late night radio uh, in the 90s, the era of Art Bell. Art mm -hmm. Bell was a nationally syndicated late night talk show. He broadcasts out of the Mojave Desert in Pahrump, Nevada, so about an hour northwest of Vegas. And he had his his radio station and his studio in a like a double wide up there on his property. And he'd walk from his house to the studio under the stars. He'd see things going by. You know, he was right by uh, Area Fifty One, uh -huh. which is mostly in in Nye County. So he called this sort of mystical realm that he was the host of, the Kingdom of Nye. And it's just great to drive around right. listening to people calling in like, I'm a security guard at Fort Irwin and I just saw the strangest thing. And uh, it was great yeah. fun. Well, I mean, yeah, and you have, I'll just mention it because uh, it's going to run out of time here, but yeah, you've got a terrific podcast, highly recommend that. And then you do have a radio show on Friday nights. Uh, yeah, you know, that's yeah. local, so you can go drive around the desert and tune in. Or I guess that was the whole that was the whole goal of that radio show. It's uh, it's on our local station Z one hundred seven point seven FM, and you can hear it in the preserve. You can hear it in Mojave National Monument, all around here, Pioneer Town. And I just love the idea of people coming across it by accident. Yeah, yeah. You're listening like a Taylor Swift song, and all of a sudden, who the hell is this guy? What's he doing? <laughs> Well, all right. So we were going to do something. We want to do some fun. We've never done this before. And this is sort of like a rapid fire uh, Q&A kind of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, a name uh, or a, a place from Ken's book. And he's going to respond with, with sort of like what comes first to his mind, like a, a Rorschach test of sorts. Okay. So ready, Ken? Yeah, ready. Rapid, rapid fire here. L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard did the Babylon working ritual with Jack Parsons in the Mojave Desert north of Rocket Site Road in uh, 1947. It opened a portal, a dimensional portal, and everything's been bad since. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Georgia O'Keeffe. Georgia O'Keeffe was a uh, mystical witch of the desert mm -hmm. who taught uh, a lot of people in the United States that the place for an artist is isolation in the desert, not hanging around, waiting for critical acclaim. Mm -hmm. Furnace Creek. Furnace Creek, in, in our usual European-American way, we took a beautiful place and built a golf course there. All right. Uh, Charles Manson. Charles Manson's dream, which we came close to living this summer and may still have coming, is for a civil war uh, with uh, cops versus uh, the oppressed. And he was going to wait out this situation, which he called Helter Skelter, in a mythical underground paradise under Death Valley that he learned about in prison from watching Ronald Reagan host Death Valley Dicks. All right. Uh, the Roswell incident. Air Force disinformation. Okay, and the last one, Death Valley. Again, another thing where white Americans came in and named a beautiful place for death when the Shoshone tribes that have lived there for centuries consider it a source of life. Right. Great. That, well, that, that, that's terrific. That, that was a lot of fun, and, and I hope uh, people enjoy it, Ken. Thank you. You did a great job. Ding, ding, ding. You know, we should uh, did I win a prize. Did yes. you, win dollars? you did. All right. So, so let me go back. Um, we got to, we're going to cut to questions, but let me close with where we began, uh, which is, you know, I'd like to urge everyone to read Ken's book as an invitation to fall in love with the Southwest. And, um, Ken, I'd like to ask if you could read the, the last two paragraphs of, of your book. 
Um, yes, I can. And we'll sign off with that and then go to some questions, please. There are many good and noble reasons to protect the wilderness that remains, to be wise stewards of the only planet we've got at this moment, keeping a wild open landscape available for our encounters with the mysterious and the divine is as good a reason as the rest and maybe the best one of all. Come on out and give it a try. Maybe you'll see a UFO. Maybe you'll see something weirder. Great. Uh, we'll see. Beth, would you like to uh, join us with some questions? Yes, I would love to. First of all, I you not only win the award, Ken, for being the first person to do the rapid, rapid fire question session, and perhaps the only person that could really truly pull it off, but our first guest to bring up Charles Manson, Aliens, and Taylor Swift in one. It's the Holy and Trinity, Beth. It's the Holy, the Holy Trinity. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so question, um, I'll, I'll start with our boss, Will Hurst, first. Um, Ken, have you walked or driven the Mojave Road? Uh, are there are some rare springs along the way? Hello, Will. Um, I haven't done it in a number of years, and you ought to come with me when I do it next. I was going to do it with Lance Gerber, the photographer from Palm Springs Life. Uh, we were going to go do a couple of days. Mojave Road is the old Spanish trail, the old Native American trail, which was then in the American way turned into a military road uh, before the Civil War. And there are various old uh, camps and remains of a fort, Fort Mojave on the Colorado River. And it cuts right through the middle of Mojave National Preserve. And I've done about two thirds of it. I haven't done the whole thing. Have you visited the Rodent Crater? The Rodent Crater? Rodent, R-O-D-E-N. No, I have not. If somebody can tell me where it is, I I, I keep a list. It, it's a it's an art project uh, that James Terrell is building. One of these sort of massive, um, terraforming, giant things like like Heiser's the the city. Oh no, no, I have not. I have not. But that yeah. if, if apparently everybody knows about it, but Desert Oracle, so <laughs> impossible. Uh, <laughs> Mary in L.A. asks. There seems like there was a long period when those New York folks were scooping in and buying land all over the Mojave. Is that yeah. still the case? And how have the demographics changed since you've been there full time? Good question. Okay, so where I am is just about too far away from Los Angeles for commuting because LA people will only commute no more than about two and a half hours each way. So it's just beyond that. That said, the pandemic has changed. Uh, so especially a lot of people who work in the trades, in the, in the entertainment industry, they had little places out here that they would use for vacations between jobs, and then they'd rent them out as Airbnbs. A lot of those people, because so much work stopped, have, have come out here, but they tend to be people who have roots here. You know, They had the capital a long time ago. Most of the Mojave, most of the California desert is protected public land. So nobody can buy it ever. Good. Um, have, let's see, um, have you, well, I I'm, can tie these together. Have you known or read Charles Bowden? And then um, Kiki would like to know where we can find your suggested reading list. Oh, very good. Uh, I have read Bowden, he's great. Um, my reading list, our local bookstore, which is called Space Cowboy Books in Joshua Tree, they have, like Alta does, a, a bookshop account. And if you look up Space Cowboy Books and Bookshop, there's a list of Desert Oracle's Desert Classics. And you can order them there and it supports our local bookstore. Or if Alta makes a list, it'll support Alta. Mm -hmm. I will grab that link, Kiki, and include it in a, a roundup email this afternoon. So we'll we'll hopefully have um, links to as many things as Blaze and Ken um, discussed today. Oh, um, somebody asked about Bukowski. 
Um, the last place I lived in Los Angeles was an apartment court uh, about a block and a half from, from Bukowski's famous apartment court. So I know that neighborhood very well. And mm -hmm. uh, his post office was, was my post office. The, the what, where, he, where he worked? No, where, where I went and stood in line to oh. mail manuscripts to be rejected by editors. <laughs> Um, what What is your view of the massive solar farms in the Mojave? I'm against them. Uh, there's no place for industrial development on public wilderness. It's not necessary. You look at those like Eye of Sauron towers between Vegas and LA on the 15. Those things don't even work. They have to pump in natural gas, a carbon fuel that's adding to greenhouse gases to keep the turbines running. So that taught us a lot. The second California Desert Protection Act did limit the placement of those big industrial facilities to what's supposed to be already disturbed lands, not wild lands. Still not good enough. They ought to be on rooftops. They ought to be close to where you have transmission towers already because every mile that, that, that solar energy travels on transmission towers, it's losing energy. So mm -hmm. That stuff can be on top of the Walmarts, you know, the shopping centers where you live. In LA, DWP has started putting them on top of reservoirs. So you got lots of good places to put them. You can put them over landfills. Can I, can I ask one question? I know, Beth, we're almost out of time here. Um, a, a very current thing, Ken, there was a one of these Utah, you know, we, we haven't touched on the monoliths, the Utah monolith, and there was one uh, apparently in Joshua Tree a couple days ago. I don't know where, how many we have now. There's, there's probably yeah. There's probably, probably. Every time I open TikTok, there's another one. You know, there was one uh -huh. in San Diego last night that they were tearing down. I'm pretty convinced that Southwest Airlines is behind it because you know when you fly on Southwest, <laughs> there are those metal things that you got to line up by. Well, they're not using them, so uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be okay. like uh, you know getaway $24 deal with the aliens or something right? or a Hulu documentary or a everything's a Hulu documentary. Yeah, one or the other. Um, well, okay. Well with that, we're out of time. We'll leave them wanting more, which I do. Ken, we've got to have you back. Um, Desert Oracle Volume 1, click the link below for more info on that. If you missed any part of today's interview or would like to share it with everyone you know, I'm going to get this up on altaonline.com later this afternoon and email all of you a link. My cat has decided to appear. Apologies. Anyway, um, I hope that if you enjoyed this, join us next week. It's our last Alta Asks Live of the year. We're, we'll be joined by Linnell George. She is an Alta contributor, a journalist, and an incredible author who has a new book out on Octavia Butler. So that is next Wednesday, 1230, um, and we'll pepper you with info about that. Ken, I'm so, you're a delight. Thank you so much. Thank for, you, Ken. Thank you, know, you so much. Thank you for having me. I, I, I love Alta. I'm so glad it's here. It's been a long time since we had a California print magazine. And uh, and you all make a very good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank Blaze, you. also. Um, and thanks Thank to you. everyone for joining us. We will um, stay safe. And um, we'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care.